Well, after episode 6, which was the highest rated in the season on IMDb, we now have episode 7, which is the lowest rated. Which will either mean that this episode is going to be a giant bland pile of nothing, or it will be a juicy slab of incompetence that I can sink my teeth into. Which one, which one? As the episode begins, we rejoin the Southlanders after the cataclysmic eruption of Mount Doom. So, I have covered why everyone here should be dead, but as Galadriel seems perfectly fine, I assume everyone else will be too. Oh wait, no, there are a couple of dead people. Okay, so did Galadriel survive because elves are literally built like Terminators? But then that would mean Arendir and Galadriel are the only two survivors. Galadriel got hit as badly as possible at the end of episode 6, apart from maybe this guy who got liquefied by a fireball, and yet she is seemingly perfectly fine. I don't know why, and to be honest I don't care. These writers are evidently just going to do whatever they want to facilitate shallow drama. We see that, although Isildur, Theo, Afrok, and Muriel have all miraculously survived, Ontamo was not so lucky. Rest in peace, Ontamo. You died as you lived. Shit. Muriel assists the soldiers in rescuing survivors, indicating that they are all willing to put themselves in harm's way to save civilians, which is of course somewhat dampened by the fact that they themselves should not be alive in the first place, meaning that the idea of harm's way is somewhat superfluous. The scene ends with Afrok rescuing Muriel from a collapsing building, but Isildur remains trapped inside. So this scene doesn't really tell us a huge amount, except that all of the main characters are alive and that Isildur is totally dead, which of course everyone believes, and the only person with a name who seems to have actually died is Ontimo, and I can only assume they killed him off so that not literally every single named character survived a volcano to the face. Okay, so Muriel is willing to put herself in danger to save civilians, and Galadriel is literally invincible. And we then return to the Harfords, who we haven't seen for quite a while. I am expecting some pretty big things from this storyline, given that this is the last episode before the season finale, and this entire plotline could be summed up in about two sentences. Nori's family have apparently reached the Grove, which was their destination, and they are excited to regroup with the other Harfords, evidently unaware that they have been left for dead now twice. If you recall, in episode 5, Malva knew that Nori's family were in fact keeping up, but apparently didn't have a change of heart even after Not Gandalf saved her life. She presumably returned to the other Harfoots, told them about how incredible Not Gandalf is, and then they just kind of kept on migrating without checking on or helping Nori's family. Yeah, sounds about right. It would be nice if this show acknowledged that a good percentage of its characters are terrible people, wouldn't it? Anyway, we see that the stranger is still helping them with the cart, meaning that whatever drama happened as a result of the accidental not freezing incident has presumably been resolved off screen. So, Nori and Poppy enter the grove, and they see... Okay, so this is apparently volcanic rock from the eruption at the end of episode 6, confirming that what we are seeing right now is taking place near enough in the immediate aftermath of the Southlands plot in episode 6. If you recall, when not Gandalf arrived back in episode 1, Arendir and Bronwyn were en route to Horden. Since that scene, approximately a week has passed, which I calculated in my coverage of episode 6 based on the evidence that we have been presented with, so I won't repeat that calculation here. This means that either the entire Harfoot migration across Middle-earth took maybe five days, or that the timeline does not line up. As far as I'm aware, there's nothing in the show that indicates that the migration took as long as a couple of months, although I am aware that one of the actors or directors apparently said that it did in fact take a couple of months, but as I don't care about anything that's not in the show, I'm going to disregard that. This means that for the timeline to line up, the migration took a few days, which it quite simply can't have done, because Nori's family were travelling slower than normal because of her dad's dodgy foot, but then actually no, they kept up with Sadok and the others, so I guess they did. Honestly, who the fuck knows? Either way, given the apparent distance that they travelled, two months sounds about right. Shame it isn't in the show! And another issue with the volcanic rock being here in the grove is that this is once again not how volcanoes work. From a quick Google search, large volcanic rocks such as this can occasionally travel up to 10 to 12 miles from the volcano during an eruption. I don't know exactly where the grove is, but going by this handy map that a redditor put together which appears to be at least vaguely accurate, and using other distances in Middle Earth that have already been established, it is at least 100 miles north of Mount Doom. So either Mount Doom was a particularly nasty and evil eruption, which would make it that much less believable that anyone in the Southlands is still alive, or that once again the writers of Rings of Power just don't know how volcanoes work and have decided to just make shit up to facilitate drama. They go boom and, and there's fire and the rocks, they fly away and it's really cool, it is 
Mum, what are we having for dinner? Anyway, because the Harfords are incapable of basic cognition and forget everything that happened longer than five minutes ago, neither Nori's family nor any of the other Harfords acknowledge that they left them behind or that they have caught up. The show has already depicted them as backwards barbarians, so I'm not expecting them to suddenly be like, oh hey, we care so much about you and stuff. But at least acknowledging that they managed to keep up in spite of being abandoned twice would have been nice. Anyway, Nori asks Sadok about the volcanic rocks that have landed in the grove. Sadok says that his great-grandmother used to speak of mountains that spat out fiery rocks, and that they sleep for hundreds of years but wake when evil is rising. I can totally accept that Sadok would believe this. Once again, the Harfords are very superstitious, having this kind of tradition handed down through the generations does line up. But it is rather amusing that the tradition also includes that the volcanoes wake up when there is evil. Either this is just some vague superstitious belief that the Harfords have, and they've just decided that fiery rocks falling from the sky is a sign of evil, which I can totally understand such a primitive society believing something like that, or potentially that this has happened before. And by this, I mean the whole shebang with the evil sword, the dam, and the trench. Or maybe there are other volcanoes. Volcanoes that are south of where the Harfoots currently are and yet are close enough to be able to launch debris into their territory. My understanding was that Mount Doom is the only volcano, but either way, Rings of Power has not been clear, which means I don't know what to conclude. Either way, if Mount Doom has erupted before, or if there are other volcanoes that have erupted before in the Southlands, then this begs the question of why no one living in the Southlands seemed to even be aware that they were living next to a volcano. Anyway, we see that the Harfords are struggling to find food because much of the greenery has been destroyed by the eruption, and Sadox suggests that Nori ask not Gandalf to fix it, which Malva also encourages. Let's quickly go over what Sadok knows. Nori had told the other Harfords that not Gandalf had fallen from the stars. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, uh, have you ever heard tell of beings falling from the stars? And we know that although Sadok has heard of similar astral phenomena, he has never heard of anything quite like what Nori is describing. He will also know at this point that not Gandalf saved Malva from the wolves in episode 5, because apparently everyone was talking about it. Is it reasonable then for Sadok to expect not Gandalf to be able to fix all the dead trees? I actually think, given the circumstances, that yes it is. Or at least it's worth a try given that they don't really have any alternatives. Except that actually they do have alternatives because there is still plenty of greenery still nearby. Either way, not Gandalf is a being that Sadok does not understand, but one that has shown himself to be willing and able to rescue the Harfords on multiple occasions. Even though he has never shown himself to be able to do anything like bring a plant back to life, I think it makes sense for Sadok to ask Nori to try. Anyway, Poppy then shoots down this idea. He's done so much for us. It's my root of us to ask more of him. Which doesn't entirely line up, either they need his help or they don't, and the fact that he has helped them before doesn't negate this, especially when Poppy and Nori have gone out of their way to help him, which if you recall, resulted in the Harfords abandoning Nori's family. Given what happens next, however, my guess is that Nori and Poppy have a bad feeling about this because of the incident with the ice in episode 5, which makes the next part even worse. So, Sadok then says that he will ask not Gandalf himself, which happens off screen. Then this child, who I think is Nori's sister, who until this point in the story has had maybe a single line of dialogue and has had zero impact on anything that has happened, decides to walk towards the tree for no reason while not Gandalf is in the process of magicking it. Uh, quite the end. It's working. Aquita! Is like said, to call you stupid would be an insult to stupid people! Nori and Poppy do not stop her, despite being aware of how dangerous not Gandalf's magic is. Nori's parents also do not stop her, and even if we assume that they were unaware of the freezing incident, what not Gandalf is doing right now is quite clearly unstable and dangerous, and is not something you should let your child go anywhere near. Which means Nori's parents are pretty incompetent. Anyway, as a result of attempting to fix the tree and bring the plants back to life, the branch snaps off, causing Nori to run forward to rescue her sister. Notably, neither of her parents move an inch until after the branch has fallen on top of them. Of course, both of them are totally fine, and not Gandalf appears to be remorseful that he hurt Nori, presumably recalling that he is peril. So, 
This scene is pretty contrived, isn't it? The Harfoots ask not Gandalf to fix a tree, when there are plenty of other trees right next to them. Nori's sister is both able and willing to walk towards the tree whilst it is being magicked when she has never interacted with not Gandalf whatsoever previously. The process of fixing the tree causes branches to fall off, which then land on Nori and her sister. This, of course, causes the Harfoots to become increasingly cautious and afraid of not Gandalf whilst he learns that he does not belong with them because he is dangerous. Gotta wonder at this point, they appear to be yo-yoing the relationship between the Harfoots and not Gandalf, seemingly to pad out the runtime. They aren't really developing anything. First, Nori liked not Gandalf because she felt responsible for him, and the Harfoots disliked him because they dislike outsiders. Then, not Gandalf helps Nori's family migrate and later rescues Malva from wolves, causing the Harfoots to like him a bit more. Then, Nori gets icicled, which causes her to be scared of him. Then, not Gandalf accidentally drops a tree on Nori and her sister in front of everyone, making everyone become scared of him. Why is this scene here? Why have the scene with the wolves in episode 5 if all it does is inform this scene? The outcome of these two scenes is that the Harfoots feel essentially exactly the same way about Not Gandalf as they did when they first saw him. My guess is that they needed stuff to happen, because so far the Harfoot plot has been pretty sparse, vapid, and uneventful compared to the other three plots, which coincidentally means it is also by far the most consistent and coherent, because there have been less opportunities for mistakes. I am saving most of this for my end of series autopsy, but for now I will just say that in episodes 1 to 6, there are 13 times as many plot issues in the Southlands plot than there are in the Harfoots plot. Okay, so Nori doesn't... Ooh, let's no, that's a zero. Doesn't seem to care that she was abandoned by the other Harfoots. And because Sadok has a bit more screen time in this episode, I'll do one of these for him. So we already know that he is superstitious, does not like outsiders, can be compassionate because he does not just straight up do what Malva says and steal Nori's wheels. He lets them die in a slightly less direct way, which I think is the show saying that he's compassionate, but also abandons his lifelong friends when they get old. Thinks dying to bees is hilarious. And in this episode, doesn't seem to care that Nori, etc., are all still alive. We then return to Khazad Doom, where Elrond and Durin have arrived after having walked across the entire width of Middle Earth, which I guess took a couple of months. If you recall, back in episode 5, we left off with Durin, who had just acquired a table from Gilgalad via some precariously unscrupulous espionage, and Elrond had revealed to Durin that the elves do indeed need Mithril, and pretty urgently. Durin then agreed to help, which I have already criticized in detail, but the scene ended with them acknowledging that they will need to convince his father. We jump in immediately on them trying to convince the king, so at least we aren't wasting any time. Elrond offers, In exchange for access to your Mithril mine, the elves are prepared to furnish this city. Game, grain, and timber from the elder forests of Eriador for the next five centuries. It is odd that Elrond just wants access to the mines. Presumably they need to mine the Mithril. If so, wouldn't dwarves naturally be the best choice to carry out that task, given the apparent danger of doing so, and given the fact that mining is literally what dwarves do? Or is the plan to just winch the elves down one by one into the vague proximity of the unmined mithril veins until they are sufficiently drenched in Silmaril goo? Hmm. Don't know, don't care. How's that? So, Elrond's rolling rings of power seems to be that of a politician and a diplomat. I think it is reasonable to assume that he would not be able to offer something as exorbitant as this without getting permission from Gilgalad, and whilst I have no doubt that Gilgalad would have been willing to pay any price, this conversation evidently happened off screen. The last time we saw Gilgalad, he was trying to convince Elrond to break his oath, which, if successful, would inform him that the dwarves have, as suspected, discovered Mithril. So, we are left to assume that after speaking with Celebrimbor about the Mithril, but before departing with Durin, Elrond at some point returned to Gilgalad and explicitly broke his oath after having done so implicitly multiple times. 
by informing him that the dwarves have what he is after. This scene might sound pointless as we wouldn't actually learn anything new, but I would propose that this would be the perfect opportunity to learn more about what Elrond actually values and to allow some further insight into what Gilgalad is willing to risk in order to acquire Mithril. This scene would have allowed the writers to be explicit as to Elrond's motivation, his potential anger at having been used as a pawn in some master plan, his upset over the elven species likely being wiped out, and his conflict over whether or not to uphold his oath to his friend. But we don't get any of that. The show just skips past it, when it was not only necessary for this plot to progress, but the only way we can hand wave this is by assuming that Elrond does in fact have the authority to offer Gain, grain, and timber from the elder forests of Eriador for the next five centuries. Without first consulting the High King of the Elves. If Elrond does have that authority, then either it means that the gift he is offering is not particularly substantial, which is contradicted in the very next line of dialogue, or it means that Gilgalad presumably allows all of his politicians to be able to offer massive amounts of wealth uninhibited when on diplomatic missions. This is all possible, but is it explained or explored? Fuck no. Anyway, the two dwarven guards then say in their language, which these subtitles refer to as Kuzdul, that Elrond's offer is quite a promise if he can keep it, and Elrond replies in English that he never made a promise that he didn't keep. I don't believe Elrond here because he lies to people seemingly without realizing in every scene that he is in. Anyway, this tells us that Elrond can speak Kuzdul, and this appears to impress the king. Elrond is then asked why the dwarves should trust any elf, which follows naturally from the king's pre-established reluctance to have anything to do with the elves, which kind of calls into question why he agreed to work with them on Celebrimbor's forge. Which of course means that the king has already trusted elves, either because he explicitly okayed their collaboration, or that he didn't make the call but allowed it to happen regardless. I think it is entirely unreasonable to suggest that the king is unaware that they are already collaborating with the elves. Anyway, Elrond's response is definitely one of the funniest fucking lines in the show. Why should we trust any elf? You should not. But you can trust me. <laughs> Motherfucker! This character might be the worst one in Rings of Power. Galadriel is an asshole that the show thinks is awesome and doesn't acknowledge whenever she does disgusting things and as such is very frustrating to watch. She is despicable, but at least she seems to be consistently despicable. Elrond, on the other hand, seems to change writers with every scene. They don't appear to remember what he did in the previous episodes. As a result, I have no idea what Elrond is going to do in each scene, whereas Galadriel is at least somewhat predictable. So, Elrond is telling the King of the Dwarves that they can trust him specifically. Oh boy, recapping starts to take longer and longer as the shit pile grows ever higher, but I will keep this as simple as I can. Elrond has already visited Durin after being absent for 20 years under false pretenses, displayed apparent shock when Durin called him out on this, managed to convince the dwarves, presumably the king, to work with the elves on building the forge, spied on Durin having a private conversation with his wife, thus breaching his trust and privacy, broken into the mithril mine, broken his oath both implicitly and explicitly, and did all of the above whilst unaware that he himself was being used in order to subvert the dwarves and either acquire Mithril or merely confirm that the dwarves have it. The show isn't exactly clear. No one should trust you. You are probably the least trustworthy character in this entire goddamn show. But you are unaware of this, because the writers are evidently unaware of this. But random, he's a shrewd politician who, of course, of course he lies to manipulate people. Get out of here, retarded alter ego, who let you out of the basement? Yes, we have been told that Elrond has become quite the politician, but we have not once seen him do this. This character is not selectively giving out information so as to get what he wants. He is not being clever. He is unaware of his past actions that any normal person would absolutely determine to be untrustworthy. How do I know this? Well, because Durin is standing right fucking next to him, and Durin is also unaware of Elrond's previous transgressions, even though those previous transgressions were against him. Anyway, Elrond then continues. Please, noble king. Help us. After witnessing Elrond's honest plea for help, the king then says that he will speak with his son, and Elrond and the guards depart. The king then tells Durin that I will not risk dwarven lives to help the elves cheat death. Cheat death? My friend is drowning. You expect me to swat his hand away because you're afraid of a bloody rock fall? 
So, this was established back in episode 4 where we saw the apparent danger involved with mining Mithril and Durin's displeasure at his father's caution in shutting down the mine, so Durin's response here is at least somewhat consistent. Unfortunately, Durin's enthusiasm in arguing Elrond's side does not make sense because of the huge amount of contradictions that we have had thus far in their relationship. One minute, he dislikes Elrond, then they are friends, then Elrond spies on him, and then they are friends, then Elrond breaks his oath, and then they are friends, then Elrond says, yo, Gilgabro needs some Mithril, then they are friends. Actually, yeah, this might be in character, as Durin is evidently unreasonably and unjustifiably trusting and gullible. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. So, yeah, the character of Durin, as depicted, would likely do exactly this. But the reason why you could argue that he would do this is because his relationship with Elrond is depicted as something of a broken seesaw. Which, once again, I do not believe is the writer's intent. The king also says that he will not risk dwarven lives, meaning that what Elrond meant by give us access to the mine was actually give us Mithril. Anyway, Durin seems to be specifically more interested in helping Elrond rather than the elves in general, and the king responds that the elves' fate was decided long ago by the Valar. The fate of the elves was decided many ages ago by minds much wiser, much farther seeing than our own. Defy their will and this entire kingdom might fall. Perhaps the entire Middle Earth. So, this draws an interesting parallel, although not one that has been sufficiently set up. Gilgalad believes that he needs Mithril to save the elves because of something relating to Silmarils, Eldars, Valar, Light, Sauron, and Trees, which I am sure makes total sense but unfortunately is not explained whatsoever in this show. Although this part is not explained, Gilgalad does explicitly explain why he believes that the elves not acquiring Mithril could lead to the end of the world. Similarly, the King of the Dwarves is unwilling to help the Elves because he believes that doing so could lead to the end of the world. Why he believes this? I have no fucking idea. Yeah, so Gilgalad's explanation of Mithril stops the evil tree goo, which stops Sauron, which brings light, or whatever it was, may not have been anywhere near adequately explained, but in-universe, we know that Gilgalad has what he considers to be a rational reason to want the Elves to have Mithril. The King, however, does not seem to have any reason to believe this. Are we just supposed to believe that he is highly superstitious about pissing off the gods by going against what he views as their plan? We have had two scenes with Durin's father totaling about four minutes of screen time, and in neither scene has there been any hint that he respects, values, or even acknowledges the gods in any form. I don't have much to go on here, but the king seemed to be extremely pragmatic and reliable, logical and wise, and devoted to his people. There was never a hint that he cared whatsoever about the gods. Of course, the other explanation would be that he is making this up in order to justify denying the elves' mithril to his son. This is definitely possible, but I'm going to assume that this is not the case because it both makes more sense and is more narratively interesting, so I'm going to assume that Rings of Power will do the lesser of these two options. Okay, so Elrond has the authority to offer vast wealth when on diplomatic missions, is multilingual, and is honest whilst also being dishonest. And I will also add one of these for King Durin III, doesn't trust elves, trusts elves, respects his son, is ruthless, acknowledges the gods, and cares about what they think. We then see Durin speaking with Deesa about what has just happened. Deesa appears to be extremely upset and angry that the king is not willing to help the elves. I have no idea why she cares so much, so I just have to assume it's because she's a nice person. Unfortunately, although I like Deesa as a character, she has had very little in terms of screen time or development. Durin appears to have accepted his father's decision, as he first asks Deesa, What choice do we have? And then says, He's more than just my father, Deesa. He's our king. Which appears to be in line with Durin's established respect for his father, even on occasions when they disagree. Then we get a small amount of world building, which is nice, but would have been good to have a few hours earlier to make clear how the dwarven society functions. We learn that there are other dwarf lords, of which Durin is presumably one due to him being the prince, and Deesa tells us that You said the other dwarf lords were open to the proposal. Which means firstly that Durin had previously asked them, presumably before speaking with his father, and secondly that they each heard Elrond's proposal and were willing to consider it. 
If only they were willing to dedicate any amount of screen time to this espionage, we could have had some potentially interesting politically charged world building. Deesa then suggests that Durin reopen the Mithril mine himself so as to prove to the other dwarf lords that Mithril can be mined safely and therefore potentially enable Durin to convince his father to help the elves. This suggests that Durin has the authority and power to do something like this even though the king has ordered it to be shut, which is confirmed later. Durin, however, refuses this idea, saying that he is unwilling to defy his king because it would set a bad example for his children. I really like this interaction. The small pieces of world building do raise as many questions as they answer, but Durin's clear dedication to his king tells us explicitly that he is unwilling to breach his values in order to help a friend. He is willing to risk the consequences of not helping the elves, whatever they may in fact be, because he wants to be a good father and a good son. Durin is clearly conflicted as he wants to help Elrond, but he is unwilling to go against his father's wishes to do so. Nice and clear. If only Elrond's interactions with Gilgalad had been anywhere near this clear, we may have understood exactly what he is doing and why. Deesa appears to accept Durin's decision and apologizes for insulting him, which tells us that although she has a temper and is not afraid to speak her mind, she also has a lot of respect for her husband and her king. Anyway, then Elrond enters and realizes that the answer is no, without either character saying a word, which is the rare example of Rings of Power exercising some level of restraint. Durin then asks Elrond to stay for dinner, which is a nice callback to episode 2 where he told him that under no circumstances is he to stay for dinner, but Elrond refuses, saying that he has to return to Gilgalad to inform him of the king's decision. Elrond then says, Gilgalad must be informed, and soon he will no longer be a king, for there will no longer be a Lindon. Which tells us that Elrond seems to fully believe what Gilgalad had told him previously, even though he had manipulated Elrond into doing what he wanted, and he, I assume, is using this information now to make Durin feel guilty. Durin then says goodbye to Elrond, and Elrond responds, We do not say goodbye. We say no more. Marie. Means more than simply farewell. It means go towards goodness. I've said it before, this guy playing Durin is leagues beyond any of the other actors in this show. If only he had better material to work with. This exchange also tells us that Durin is familiar with some elven customs, or at minimum knows a couple of their words. Elrond then hands Durin the piece of Mithril that he was given in episode 4, and he departs. I'm gonna be totally honest with you guys, my cold, dead, cynical heart wants to feel something during this scene. Durin breaking down into tears in front of his friend because he will likely never see him again, and because he was unable to help the elves, which will presumably lead to them returning to Valinor forever. I know that a lot of this was set up incredibly poorly, and I know that Durin and Elrond's relationship is inconsistent at best, but this actor's performance nearly made me forget all that for 30 seconds or so. The power of acting. Maybe the reason this stands out is because of how monotonous every other character in this show is, but either way, this guy gets an A plus for effort. So, we have just had a hint of something good in Rings of Power. Is it time for them to completely ruin it with some nonsense contrived storytelling? You bet your ass it is! So, throughout this scene, Durin was holding the corrupted leaf that Gilgalad had in episode 1. In the previous scene, his father was also holding it. This means that Gilgalad gave it to Elrond to use to persuade the king to help them. Anyway, in his frustration, Durin throws the piece of mithril across the table, and it stops right next to the corrupted leaf. The corruption in the leaf then begins to dissipate, and both Durin and Deesa are shocked to see this. Durin then shouts to Elrond to return, presumably having been convinced by this phenomena, to defy his father and help the elves. Wow. So they totally undid everything good about this scene. So, firstly the conveniences. Durin accidentally throws the mithril carelessly across his table, and not only does it not fall off the table, but it just so happens to stop right next to the corrupted leaf. In this moment, Durin is extremely emotional and frustrated. What would arguably have made more sense is if he hurled the mithril at the wall in anger, as we have already seen Durin to have a short temper, and this would also reinforce how durable the mithril is, and it would make sense for him to do this because the mithril is at this point causing him more trouble than it is potentially worth. Instead of angrily hurling it across the room though, he slides it across the table to oh so conveniently end up right next to the corrupted leaf. Why does Durin have the Corrupted Leaf? There is just as much chance of his father keeping it, or Elrond taking it with him. Also, the Mithril evidently has exactly the effect that Gilgalad expected that it would, which confirms that everything he said in Episode 5 pretty much has to be true, even though he can't have known this. Also, if Elrond was in possession of both the Mithril and the Corrupted Leaf, I simply do not believe that at no point in the months of walking across Middle-earth to get to Khazad-dûm did he not try this out. 
He knows what both of these things are. He evidently believes what Gilgalad said the Mithril will do, so he has no reason not to put them next to each other to see what happens, as this would both confirm whether or not Gilgalad is right and go a long way towards convincing Durin of how important the Mithril is to the elves. And not only did he not intentionally do this, but he apparently did not do this even by accident. Surely having both the mithril and the corrupted leaf in the same bag or in opposite pockets or something would cause precisely this to happen. It may even have made for an interesting payoff. Having Elrond present the corrupted leaf to the king only to find that it is no longer corrupted, and then deducing that the mithril had healed it by accident. Probably the biggest problem here, however, is Durin's response to this. He reacts with shock upon seeing the mithril heal the corrupted leaf. There is no reason why he would find this shocking. He has been told by Elrond exactly why the elves need mithril. Durin knows as much as Gilgalad does. The reason Elrond's proposal was refused is not because no one believes that the Mithril will actually save the elves, it was because the king apparently does not want to interfere with the god's plan. Showing this to Durin or his father should not surprise them whatsoever because they have already been told by Elrond what Mithril does. To avoid any suggestions that I am nitpicking here because that is bound to happen if people don't listen to the words that I'm actually using. If Durin had carelessly thrown the mithril into the bin, then this would be a different story. Durin has a reason to discard both the corrupted leaf and the mithril because he is emotionally devastated and neither item is of any use to him anymore. If he had discarded both into a trash can or a dwarven equivalent, then I would have far less of a problem with this scene. I have to be a bit pedantic here to make this point, so bear with me. Trash cans are somewhere where you specifically put things you don't want to keep. Durin has a reason to discard both of these items. This means that these two items ending up next to each other in the trash can is a perfectly reasonable and explicable thing to happen. What we get in the show, however, is that Durin puts the leaf on the end of the table and then just so happens to throw the mithril at the leaf instead of quite literally anywhere else. And therefore, by accident, the two items end up so close together that the mithril has the effect of undoing the corruption in the leaf. Therefore, the leaf and the mithril ending up next to each other is contrived. And the reason why this matters is because this contrivance directly advances the story. Okay, so Elrond is willing to emotionally blackmail his friends and is forgetful and unobservant. Durin deeply respects his father and can be emotionally fragile. Deesa respects her husband and her king and is not afraid to speak her mind. We then return to the ruins of the Southlands, where Galadriel is accompanying Theo, presumably to locate Arendir and or Bronwyn. I have no idea why these two are traveling separately to everyone else when they were all in the same location when the volcano hit them. I guess the writers decided that they have been separated in order to give them some alone time and therefore to advance each of their plots. This, of course, also requires not only that Galadriel wake up right next to Theo and only Theo, but also that neither character decide to stick around and help anyone else. Theo asks Galadriel why the orcs did this. This suggests that Theo knows that the orcs did something, which, from his perspective, would this not have been a perfectly natural, although admittedly rare, occurrence of a volcano erupting? Is he assuming that bad guys getting evil sword equals volcanic eruption? Bit of a leap, but okay. Galadriel's response, though, is going to explain why Adar made the volcano go boom. To make this their home. Their shadow land. Oh wait, no she isn't. You keep telling us that this makes the Southlands their home, but this doesn't make sense. Firstly, the orcs should all be dead, as should you. Secondly, that Galadriel says their Shadowland, combined with Adar's line from episode 5, seems to imply that the volcano erupting will block out the sun and thus create a Shadowland which will therefore be an appropriate home for the orcs. This does not work on any level. A volcanic cloud of ash can certainly block out the sun, for a few days, and making a volcano erupt is quite obviously extremely risky if the plan is to decimate the Southlands when all of the orcs are in the Southlands in order to give these orcs a home, and the show changes its mind in every episode as to how the orcs react to sunlight. So yeah, 
This is a piss poor explanation. Pretty pathetic, huh? Theo suggests taking the land back from the orcs, which Galadriel decides against. We then get what I think the writers consider to be both character progression and development of a theme. Or put steel down their throat. It is over. Not for me. I won't allow it. We must. We must. So here, Theo reaches for Galadriel's dagger that she took from Finrod centuries ago, this dagger acting as a physical manifestation of Galadriel's drive for vengeance, but Galadriel stops him. This informs us that Galadriel may have actually developed as a character, which is reinforced by the next line. What are you so bothered about? It isn't your fault. Yes, it is. So, by this point, you guys know that I am not a fan of Galadriel, and you know why. There is one explanation, though, as to how this is her fault, but I do not believe that the show is aware of it, so I will explain. The show seems to be suggesting that Galadriel is coming to learn that eternal vengeance does not lead to positive outcomes. She is starting to accept that she needs to be driven by something other than violence, because the devastation of the Southlands is the consequence of that violence. Say it with me, guys. You know what's coming. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. So, from Galadriel's perspective, because remember, she does not know what we know. She acquired an army, arrived just in time to save the Southlanders, captured their leader, and then the volcano destroyed everything. If you remember from episode 6, Arendir told her to make sure Adar does not escape with the evil sword before she and Halbrand capture Adar. Galadriel at no point checks to see what Adar was actually carrying, and neither does Arendir, meaning that Theo is at this point the only character who could possibly know that the volcano erupting was as a result of the evil sword. I don't believe that Theo has anywhere near enough information to conclude this himself, but my point is specifically that Galadriel failed to check what Adar was carrying, and as a result they were unable to stop the volcano erupting. Had Galadriel checked and then said to Arendir, yeah, he's just got this axe, I don't know what you were so worried about. This may not have actually led to anyone being able to stop Waldreg in time, but regardless, Galadriel made the mistake of not even checking when checking could potentially have prevented the volcano from erupting. So, sounds like Galadriel is learning from her mistakes, right? Wrong, because Galadriel is unaware that she even made this mistake. She does not know what the evil sword is. She does not know what the evil sword does. She has never seen the evil sword. She does not know that what Adar was in fact carrying was not what Arendir believed him to be carrying. She thought she had done exactly what Arendir had asked her to do. She does not know that the volcano erupting has anything to do with her own action or inaction. But, because I guess she has to develop at some point, so episode 7 out of 8 is as good a time as any, the writers decided that she has as much information as we the audience when she simply does not. Anyway, we then see the survivors, and frankly there are a lot of them, leaving the ruins of the Southlands. Elendil notices Beric, Isildur's horse, but notably Isildur is not present. Implication being that Elendil is worried as to his son's safety. Why he is worried is unclear because this volcanic eruption appears to have been about as dangerous as chickenpox. Elendil then hears that Muriel has survived and he regroups with her and Afrok before learning that they know where Isildur is and that he is not with them implies that Isildur is dead. I think, given that Afrok is Isildur's friend, and both he and Muriel are his superiors, that it's reasonable to assume that they confirmed that Isildur is actually dead before abandoning him in those burning ruins. But Isildur, of course, cannot be dead. So this means that they didn't. I don't know why the writers are wasting our time trying to even imply that Isildur is dead. There are around 40 characters in Rings of Power who have either been named or have had any amount of dialogue, and the only ones who explicitly cannot die during Rings of Power are Galadriel, Elrond, Gilgalad, Sauron, Elendil, and Isildur. If this sequence plays out the way I expect it to, I imagine we will learn something about both Elendil and Isildur, but why bother with the dramatic cliffhanger? Everyone knows Isildur is alive. And we then cut back to Theo and Galadriel, who are travelling to where the Numenorean camp was located, as Galadriel believes that this is where any survivors will be heading. She tells Theo to... Be wary. The orcs will move in daylight now. And she confirms that yes, as a result of the Ash Cloud, the orcs can now move in daylight uninhibited. Well, actually daytime, not daylight, as there shouldn't really be any light if the sun is blocked by- You know what, I'm just going to assume that this was a typo in the script. Theo then says that Galadriel should not worry about him because he has killed orcs before. Some of Theo's kills were off screen, but I think at a minimum we have to assume he's killed maybe five orcs total. This might suggest that orcs are not anywhere near as threatening as we have been led to believe if a child can repeatedly defeat them in combat and consequently does not seem to be afraid of them whatsoever. 
Theo's reaction in episode 2 was perfectly reasonable. He was absolutely terrified of the Tunnelly boy, at least initially. Which makes sense. I guess the reason he is now super confident and unfazed by the idea of fighting orcs is because he has realized that they are pushovers. Gladriel says that she has killed many orcs, which Theo applauds as good, but Gladriel refuses this compliment, saying, I would not use such words. Why not? It darkens the heart. To call dark deeds good. It gives place for evil to thrive inside us. The evil is gone. Then why is it not gone from in here? Sometimes to find the light. We must first touch the darkness. Do you see what they're doing here? I mean, yeah, you've kind of got to have worse eyesight than Ray Charles or worse cognitive ability than, well, Patrick McKay and John D. Payne to not see what they are doing here. Gladriel then says that she thinks she can make Theo a soldier and hands him her sword. This is a tiny payoff to Theo's apparent admiration of Galadriel when he first saw her in episode 6. Unfortunately, all we get is she gives him a sword and he doesn't really react to it. Maybe this is the actor, the direction, the writing, I have no idea. Mediocrity just kind of compounds into amorphous cosmic soup. We then cut back to Elendil, Muriel, and Afrok, who are also heading to the Numenorean encampment. Wait a moment! The last time we saw these characters, literally two minutes ago, Elendil was asking them where his son is. There is no response that they can give him that would lead to him accompanying them to the encampment. Unless they lied to him and said, oh yeah, Isildur, he's already at the encampment. Which is impossible and is also very much the opposite of what was implied. So, this means that Elendil does not particularly care about the whereabouts of his son, alive or dead. I know that he's been shown to be extremely dedicated to protecting the Queen, but especially given that Muriel is already very well protected, I do not believe that Elendil would abandon his son in order to escort Muriel to safety. Especially if Afrok told him explicitly what happened to Isildur. Anyway, Muriel appears to be literally blinded by the fire that went in her face, and she is understandably traumatized by what she has been through. She tells Elendil and Afrok to help her hide the fact that she is very clearly struggling to maintain her composure. She wants to appear as the leader the Numenorians and the Southlanders need, even though she is not handling the situation particularly well. Apart from the rather blunt dialogue, I like this. This is showing us, without contradiction, what Muriel values. Every now and then we get something like this in Rings of Power. 90% of the dialogue either seems to be expositional or to exist purely to advance the plot, so having a short exchange that does nothing to serve the plot and only exists to serve character is very much something that the show needs to do more. In typical Rings of Power style, though, even when it succeeds, it does so just barely, because as I mentioned, the dialogue here is extremely blunt and overt, and we also only learn about Muriel, despite Elendil and Afrok also being present. Okay, so Galadriel is omniscient. Muriel abandons people and understands the importance of her role as leader. And Elendil cares about Isildur's safety and also does not care about Isildur's safety. And we then return to the grove where Sadok is telling not Gandalf where he can find his people, meaning humans. This tells us that Sadok and presumably the other Harfoots have decided that accidentally dropping a tree on an idiot was the last straw and they have decided to ask him to leave. Not Gandalf has slowly been realizing that he is peril, and yeah, relative to the other Harfoots especially, he certainly is dangerous. He is evidently very powerful and not entirely in control of what he does. The Harfoots are not safe with him around. This is what the show wants us to think, but this is dampened by the fact that on both of the two occasions in which Not Gandalf has caused harm to the Harfoots, it was directly as a result of the Harfoots acting like morons with zero common sense, and in both cases, he was entirely unaware that he was even causing them harm. So whilst it is definitely understandable that, from the Harfoots' perspective, Not Gandalf does not belong with them and should leave for their own safety, the Harfoots and the show are evidently unaware that a good amount of fault lies with Nori specifically and her disabled sister. As Sadok and Not Gandalf walk away from the tree, we see that his magic did actually do what was intended as life seems to be sprouting from the trunk which acts purely as foreshadowing for what comes later. Anyway, not Gandalf goes to say goodbye to Nori, who hands him an apple. Nori is clearly emotional about having to say goodbye to him, although she does not say a word, presumably because she agrees that he does not belong with them. I saw that star falling. Should have just let us alone. Ellen, you tried to tell me, Mother. But now I understand. I'm just a Harfoot. That's all I'll ever be. 
So, we then see that as a result of her wacky escapades with not Gandalf, Nori has learned that she actually isn't special, she should have listened to her mother, and she should have kept her nose out of trouble. This does make sense, but of course because this world and its characters are puppeteered by the powers that be, this won't last long, because Nori needs to flip back to thinking she is special, not listening to her mother, and sticking her nose in trouble. This will of course all be fully justified, I have no doubt. Cut to Galadriel and Theo who are taking a break from travelling across the ruined Southlands to have a chat. Theo asks if Galadriel has ever lost someone, likely as he now believes he has quite possibly lost his mother. Galadriel, as established in episode 2, has lost approximately 220 million friends, so it is safe to say that she has lost some people. I wonder if we will ever learn about any of them who are not the one guy that the show apparently has the rights to name. My brother. Finrod. Nah, I guess not. Galadriel has lost untold numbers of companions, friends, and family, but the only one she is ever able to name is Finrod, thank you contractual obligations. And my husband. Whoa, wait, you mean Caliborn? Caliborn. Wow. Okay, this presents me with something of a challenge. The writers of Rings of Power are deviating in an incredibly substantial way from the source material, but to remain consistent with everything I have said until this point, I have to ignore the fact that this is not how it went in Tolkien's books. Firstly, let's go over what the scene actually tells us explicitly. Galadriel says how she and Celeborn met. She says that she used to dance and that this was how he noticed her. Celeborn then left to join the war, and Galadriel never saw him again. Now let's go over the far more interesting and far more consequential implications of this. So, the elves left to fight Morgoth's forces including both Finrod and Celeborn. Finrod is killed, Caliborn is never seen again, so is either dead or missing. As Galadriel claims to have never seen Caliborn again after he left to join the war, this means that at the point in time when Finrod is killed, and Galadriel decides to take up an oath of vengeance against Sauron, her husband has either been defeated in battle, been wounded, been unable to get to safety, and captured and or executed by the enemy, and instead of trying to find and potentially rescue her husband, Galadriel decides instead to chase the remnants of Sauron for hundreds of years in order to avenge her brother. This, plus the fact that Galadriel has not once mentioned him until this point, can only tell us that Galadriel either did not or does not care about her husband. We also have extremely limited information about Celeborn himself, but we do know that Celeborn presumably loved Galadriel, that he was a soldier and therefore presumably had certain qualities, such as bravery and competence, etc. We know almost nothing about Celeborn, but I can say with certainty that he deserved better. It is possible that Galadriel tried to find Celeborn, somehow ruled out that he was still alive all before Finrod was killed in the subsequent murder quest, but again, this isn't in the show. All we know is that Galadriel seems to be content with I never saw him again, but when her brother dies she decides now is the time to dedicate my entire existence to annihilating everything peripherally related to Sauron. Anyway, Theo then pushes back on Galadriel's earlier statements about this all being her fault, saying that he considers it to be his fault. It isn't your fault. It's mine. You did not intend for this to happen. I gave power to the enemy, so that makes me responsible. Okay, even if we ignore the fact that not handing over the evil sword would have directly led to Theo watching his mother be murdered in front of him, presumably followed by everyone else in the tavern, Theo cannot know that giving Adar the evil sword led to the volcano exploding. This is not a natural chain of causation. This is not like giving Sauron the One Ring and then Sauron using the power that everyone knows it has to take over Middle-earth. This is Theo gave Adar a magic sword and a few hours later the volcano exploded. From what the show has told us, the only people who know that the evil sword equals volcanic eruption are Adar and Waldreg. Waldreg knows because Adar apparently told him in the space of about five seconds, and Adar knows because shut up and don't think about it. Which is a colourful way of saying that Theo cannot know that this is in any way his fault. Galadriel then tells Theo that he shouldn't feel bad because he didn't intend for anything bad to happen, and he did what he did to save his mother. You did not intend for this to happen. I gave power to the enemy, so that makes me responsible. Some say that is the way of things, but I believe the wise also look upon what is in our hearts. And this was not in yours. Galadriel, of course, does not know this. She was not present when this happened, and so she is just reading Theo and concluding that he isn't evil. Do not take the burden of this day upon your shoulders, Theo. You may find it difficult to put it down again. Well then, is Galadriel telling us that she regrets the direction her life has taken? Does she wish she had stayed at home with her husband and started a family instead of abandoning him after he goes missing in a war and then spends hundreds of years madly trying to locate Sauron? Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Theo then asks how is he supposed to let this go, and Galadriel says, There are powers beyond darkness at work in this world. 
Perhaps on days such as this, we have little choice but to trust to their designs and surrender our own. Thea refuses this, saying that his home is gone and that he is responsible, which again he can't know, but anyway. And he asks, Where's the design in that? Galadriel's response is almost literally, God works in mysterious ways. I cannot yet see it. She is trying to make Theo feel better by saying that there are supernatural forces that exist and do… stuff. And not all of them are evil, but the ones that are good do stuff sometimes for some reason and yeah, feel better champ. I guess she gets points for effort, just not for actually saying anything meaningful. But oh no, the orcs are now, they're here, and I guess they also survived the volcano, good to know. Theo starts to draw his dagger, but is prevented from doing so by Galadriel. The writers are clearly trying to draw a parallel between Theo and Galadriel by depicting her as the wise elder who sees her younger self in Theo. Theo seems to be absorbed by feelings of vengeance and guilt, and he feels that killing orcs will satisfy this and give him peace. Galadriel learned five minutes ago that this is wrong, and she wants to steer Theo away from this path, as it has only brought her pain. Alright, cool idea in principle, so does it work? No. So Galadriel's drive for vengeance came from her brother being killed by Sauron, and she knows that it was Sauron because he drew a map on Finrod's body. Why her husband disappearing didn't provoke a similar response is unknown, but I digress. Theo conversely somehow knows that giving Adar the evil sword directly caused the devastation of the Southlands, and he thinks his mother might now be dead as a result. Neither of these make much sense, but at least Galadriel's adheres to cause and effect, provided you ignore the husband factor. Now, as for Galadriel's apparent change of heart and feelings of regret, this also doesn't work because fucking yesterday she was fully on board with slaughtering everything that looked at her funny. Genocider of slaves, remember? And now, apparently believing that she is to some degree responsible for the volcanic eruption and subsequent deaths of… three people? She has flipped and decided that vengeance does not lead to positive outcomes. An example of this kind of thing being done exceptionally well is in American History X. I won't spoil anything here because if you haven't seen the movie, it is fantastic. Go and watch it right now. Yes, that is an order. The setup for the movie is that Derek is a racist skinhead who is fully driven by feelings of hatred and revenge. Due to the events that occur in the film, which I will not spoil here, Derek tries to make sure his brother, Danny, does not go down the same path he did. These characters are incredibly detailed, and the movie dedicates a substantial amount of its two hour runtime to fleshing out this relationship. It is absolutely believable. In Rings of Power, Galadriel has had about five minutes of screen time with Theo, all of which is after the eruption of Mount Doom and Galadriel's supposed change of heart. The end result is that this short narrative arc is both nonsensical and rushed as hell. Anyway, the orcs have a look around but do not discover them and the scene ends with… Rest while you can. We move at first light. What light? suggesting that Theo is not listening to Galadriel's advice. He is evidently so racked with guilt and loss because he somehow knows that his actions led to this and that his mother is maybe dead, that he is going to ignore advice from someone whom he quite clearly looks up to and admires. This is certainly possible, but it needs a hell of a lot longer than five minutes to develop. Okay, so Galadriel does not want Theo to end up like her. Theo is clairvoyant and feels extremely guilty. And we then cut back to Khazad Doom to find out what exactly Durin and Elrond are going to do now that both of them have decided to defy the king and get some mithril. We see Durin doing some mining, suggesting that he has reopened the mithril mine and is now digging away on his own without any other dwarves to back him up, and presumably without anyone else knowing that they are actually here, given that this is against the wishes of Durin's father. I, I guess Deesa knows, actually. Let's see if that goes anywhere. Anyway, as the show established previously, there are no guards guarding the single most valuable resource in Middle-earth. Earth, so Durin and Elrond are able to do this without anyone noticing, for now at least. This also tells us that the king did not suspect that something like this might happen after listening to Elrond's proposal. He knows that the elves know about and desperately want Mithril, and yet the king has evidently not decided to add any kind of security measures beyond fucking none in order to prevent exactly this from happening. King Durin III and Deesa were the only two good characters in this show, and episode 7 is certainly taking steps to dismantle them. 
Anyway, Durin takes a break from mining, and we then learn that Elrond deliberately lost the right of plot contrivance in Episode 2. Uh, did the writers not read the script for Episode 2 when they wrote the script for Episode 7? Evidently not, so I'll remind them and you, because obviously they're watching this, the deal was that if Elrond wins he will be granted a single boon, and if he loses he is to be banished from all dwarven lands. Elrond has just told Durin that he lost on purpose in order to be able to speak to him. This means that either Elrond knew that the single boon on offer had he won did not include an audience with Durin, or he knew that Durin would agree to escort him personally and thus allow him to offer his proposal if he loses. He also knew that Durin would be in any way receptive to the proposal, and he was willing to do all of the above whilst risking being banished from all dwarven lands. Which, of course, didn't end up happening because I guess they're friends now, so Durin is above the law or something. Point being, Elrond claims to have been able to defeat Durin in the contest, which I don't believe, but evidently Elrond does, meaning that rather than winning and requesting to speak to Durin, he decided that losing, being banished, and asking Durin to walk him to the door was a better way of being able to speak to him. This is incredibly special levels of writing, but okay. Elrond might be the least intelligent character in the show. Until the next scene, I guess. That's the way it goes in this show. The mightiest thing a dwarf can do is to be worthy of the name of his father. So this means that Durin places high value in living up to his father's name, which is in line with what we know about their relationship, but he is also willing to espouse this whilst literally defying the king. Is this treason? If not for Elrond, it sure as shit must be for Durin. They are stealing something incredibly valuable to the king of Khazad Doom. And whilst doing so, Durin is telling us that the mightiest thing a dwarf can do is to be worthy of the name of his father. Anyway, they keep on digging and end up finding a vast chamber filled with unprecedented amounts of mithril. And they then turn around and who could possibly be standing there but Durin's father, the king. This made me laugh out loud. Firstly, this confirms that he did suspect that Durin and or Elrond might try something like this, but did not think to station any guards outside. And this character who has been established to be overly and unreasonably cautious has just walked into the mine that has been established to be closed due to it being extremely dangerous. The king refuses to even look at the newly discovered mithril veins and orders that his guards seize Elrond, who is then escorted out of khazad -dûm and left in exactly the same location that he abandoned Celebrimbor in back in episode 2 way back in the long, long ago, when I didn't fully understand how bad this show was going to get. So, Elrond has been banished from khazad -dûm, which is exactly what should have happened in Episode 2. Where is the rest of his punishment? He just tried to steal your incredibly valuable mineral after you declined to provide it to him. His punishment is… Y you can leave, and tell the High King, and given the stakes, likely bring about a war. That's a damn stupid thing to do. Yeah, they've done it. They've made King Durin III into a clown who I cannot take seriously meaning that Deesa is the one character that I think isn't some variety of idiot. And we then see Durin facing the consequences of his actions. Durin's father says that although he was ill-formed as a baby, he fought through this and was destined to move mountains. Durin then criticizes his father for suffocating in him any ambition, and the king says that he is a strict father because that is what is necessary for Durin to be the best leader possible. This, for the moment, functions because it gives us non-contradictory information and it reinforces the character traits that have already been established. Then things get sticky. Durin makes an emotional appeal to his father after having been unsuccessful in doing precisely this the first time. He says that allowing the elves, whom he refers to as their allies, to die is not something he approves of, and he says that Elrond is as much a brother to me as if he'd been fired in my own mother's womb. The show seems to be telling us that Durin specifically wants to save Elrond rather than the elves as a whole, given the specific, or to be more specific, the not specific in the slightest, reason why the king declined to help the elves by giving them mithril, there is no reason why this form of argumentation would have any chance of working. And wouldn't you know it, it doesn't work. How dare you invoke your mother's memory to defend your decision to betray your own kind! So, this is the big emotional outburst where Durin and his father finally tell each other what they really think and shed any pretense of respect. They are not going to be civil because of how strongly they feel that they are in the right. Sure is a shame that this doesn't make sense, isn't it? So the king feels that Durin has betrayed the dwarves. Durin did indeed defy the king's wishes, but he didn't actually do anything other than go into the mine with Elrond and locate more mithril. This is not exactly a betrayal of the dwarves, it hasn't actually cost them anything, but it is specifically a betrayal of the king. And Durin, in turn, feels that his father has betrayed the dwarves because he is squandering their future so he can cling to their past. Allowing the elves to die because their time has come, so saith the gods, and that intervening in any way might doom their own kingdom, is not 
clinging to the past. Yes, the elves were willing to make a substantial offer in exchange for Mithril, and you could argue that not trading the immensely valuable mineral that you and only you currently claim ownership of could be argued to be squandering their future because simply sitting on a pile of Mithril doesn't actually help the dwarves in any way. If the king actually wanted to either help the elves because it is a nice thing to do, or if he wanted to help them because they are willing to pay him a huge amount of cash, then this argument would make sense. As the king is refusing to help the dwarves because he is unwilling to interfere with the god's plan, this argumentation does not function at all. This would be like Galadriel saying to Elendil, we should go to war, and then Elendil says, no, the gods said that it's a bad idea. And then Galadriel, in an effort to convince him, says, come on, you'll, you'll get laid. Elendil will just be like, what? I just, no, I just said that the gods told me not to. Anyway, as a result of this outburst, the king removes a part of Durin's armor, which I assume is a symbol of him being a dwarven prince or lord or something. I will say that if you ignore the writing, the acting in this scene is pretty fantastic. It is definitely cathartic to finally see these two characters release their built-up anger at each other. As both characters are quite clearly extremely emotional, I am not going to be too harsh on this scene as a whole, because it goes some length to explaining why their argumentation is somewhat suboptimal. So Elrond is an idiot. Durin is also an idiot. And is willing to speak his mind if he feels he is correct. And the king is unfortunately also an idiot and does not respond well to shouting matches. And we then cut back to the goddamn Harfords and I still don't care. Because I have committed to covering every aspect of the show though, I don't have a choice. I bear this pain for you, dear viewer. So it appears that not Gandalf's magic made all the trees come back to life and there is now food everywhere. This is admittedly surprising, although it of course does not change the fact that not Gandalf is still dangerous and does not belong with them. The question was never, will his magic work? I also find it highly amusing that the Harfords are supposed to be wandering nomads who go from place to place in order to be able to eat and therefore survive, so they should absolutely know how trees work. Evidently, however, they do not know how trees work, because they pluck all of the fruit from the freshly magicked trees and start stockpiling them. Meaning that in a week, at most, all of their food will be rotten and inedible, and they will then have to wait months for it to grow back. Yet another example of the Harfords having the survival instincts of autistic lemmings. Anyway, Poppy wanders off to get some muddy water from a river and sees a large footprint and then she evaporates. Yeah, I'm entirely as confused as you are. We then see her bucket go downstream, although how far downstream is unclear, and uh, oh yeah, I remember these fuckers. These are the people who haven't said a single word and appeared on screen for literally 15 seconds at the beginning of episode 5. So anyway, now these androgenites have Poppy's bucket, which I guess is bad. Literally the only thing we know about them is that they are looking for not Gandalf, and they themselves look about as unambiguously evil as is possible. The fucking wolves had more of a setup than these femboys. Anyway, we then see that Poppy did not, in fact, evaporate. She was hiding under some bushes with Nori. Both of them then observe the Androgenites from a distance, meaning that they are incredibly close to the glade where the Harfoots have migrated to. We then see Feminem yoink a flower from a tree. Presumably, this is one of the trees that not Gandalf fixed. Anyway, then for some ungodly reason, Nori leaves the bush and tells them that they are going the wrong way, and then the Androgenites evaporate. Okay, so before I continue with this scene, I need to properly explain what just happened. The Androgenites are looking for not Gandalf. Nori apparently knows this despite not having actually seen these people before. Because she presumes them to be evil, and let's be honest, fucking look at them, she decides to leave her hiding place and thus put her life and the lives of every other Harfoot at risk in order to misdirect them by telling them to head the other way, thus concealing not Gandalf's true location. Put more simply, Nori correctly assumes who these people are and what they are looking for, and she risks everything to try and make sure they don't find not Gandalf. There are no stakes here because we have no idea who these people are, and the consequences of them finding not Gandalf are entirely unknown. For all Nori knows, maybe they're gonna teach him magic. The only reason why this makes any degree of sense is because these people look like they literally just walked out of a Californian university campus. They could not possibly look more evil if they tried. Anyway, one of the creepsters reaches out of the darkness and steals an acorn from Nori's head. I have absolutely no idea why she, he, or it did this, but maybe this will be explained somewhat in episode eight. No, it fucking won't. Nori's father then puts himself between the androgenites and Nori and tells them to back off. Feminem then puts out the fire by touching it and proceeds to destroy everything.
Well, that wasn't very nice, was it? And yes, this is entirely Nori's fault. She had no idea what these people were capable of when she revealed herself to them. They could potentially have killed her and or her father by simply looking at them. And despite this incredible lack of information, Nori risks the lives of everyone nearby in order to maybe help not Gandalf. As for why the Androgenites decided to do this, I guess, I mean, they're evil. <laughs> so this scene is quite the turnaround for the tiniest hint of a character arc that we had set up for Nori in the previous scene. She was previously coming to terms with the fact that having anything to do with not Gandalf, quote, going off trail, so to speak, had adverse consequences for herself, her family, and her community. This makes some degree of sense. She appeared to be accepting that she should not have done this and that her mother was right. Now, in this scene, she sees these three weirdos looking at a tree. Therefore, they're looking for not Gandalf. Nori decides that she under no circumstances can permit this to happen, so she tells them to bugger off. As a result, her village is burned down. Is anyone going to acknowledge that this is Nori's fault? Are we going to get any reason as to why Nori did this? Are we going to get any reason as to why Evil McGee did this? Is Nori going to acknowledge that her actions directly led to this? Honestly, this sequence of events should absolutely devastate Nori. She should be traumatized for life. She should be constantly asking herself how she could have been so stupid. She should be wishing that she had never met not Gandalf. Maybe this will happen. <laughs> I can't even say that with a straight face. The next half at scene will make clear exactly how catastrophic of a problem this is, so I will leave this here. So Nori is an idiot, is willing to risk her life to protect not Gandalf, is willing to put everyone's lives at risk when it suits her. We then cut back to the Numenorean encampment. A quick tangent about this encampment, if you don't mind. How does this exist? There are two possible ways, and neither of them make any sense. Method 1. The Numenorians arrive via boat, land here, set up their camp in maybe a day or so, and then ride over the mountains to go and help the Southlanders. This is certainly possible, because whilst Galadriel and the Numenorians were not exactly taking their time, they also weren't rushing to get to the Southlands as soon as humanly possible because they did not know that their help was urgently required. Regardless, if the Numenorians did stop for a day to set up camp, then this makes their timely arrival in Episode 6 that much more contrived. It should also raise questions from the Southlanders as to how many of their people died whilst the Numenorians were pitching each other's tents. And the second method would be that the Numenorians landed here, and then the vast majority of them immediately left to save the Southlanders. And then a handful of men stayed behind to set up and protect the encampment. This also doesn't work, because it means firstly that the Numenorians knew that those extra numbers would not be needed in battle. Need I remind you, they had no idea of the size of the Orc army. And secondly, it means that in less than a day, those men were able to set up this entire encampment. How many men stayed behind is irrelevant, because whichever direction you swing the number, it makes the opposing issue worse. Anyway, Elendil notices Isildur's horse Beric freaking out because of all the death and fire and volcano and stuff, and Elendil does his Aragorn thing of talking to horses, except that when depicted in The Lord of the Rings, it was relatively subtle. Whereas here in Rings of Power... No. You're going home. Do you hear me? You're coming with us. Elendil literally just tells the horse to stop it because he's going... He's, he's safe now. Beric doesn't appear to listen to this, and Afrok says that the horse will in fact not listen to anyone. As a result of this, Elendil decides to let the horse go. fucking horse is going to find a Sildor, isn't he? God damn it, the number of moving parts at play here that simply do not function is barely comprehensible. And all because, guys, Aragorn's horse saved him, and he's a Sildor's heir. Anyway, Elendil then says that he regrets saving Galadriel. I should never have pulled the elf on board. I mean, yeah. I said this before, but you justified committing treason because the sea is always right, when you could have just as easily left her and justified that because the sea is always right. If this were real life, leaving two people adrift in the middle of the ocean on a plank of wood would be a pretty indefensibly evil thing to do, and not something that I think Elendil would do, especially if he had the means to rescue them. They will die, and you could have saved them. The problem here is that there are a number of factors at play in Rings of Power that make this very much not as clean-cut as I just laid out. Bringing Galadriel to Numenor constitutes treason. Taking her anywhere else is not an option given the distances. 
Galadriel is only in this situation entirely because of her own idiocy, which Elendil is unaware of but does not give us any reason to root for her survival. Additionally, being stranded in the middle of the ocean with no food or water doesn't appear to be a particularly bad situation to find oneself in, given that Galadriel voluntarily put herself in precisely that situation, meaning that the consequences of Elendil just leaving her floating there are presumably nowhere near as devastating as doing so in real life. And the nail on the head of this mess is that Elendil believes the sea to always be right and as such can justify any action he takes by claiming that the sea did it. The sea made him cross paths with Galadriel. Or the sea destroyed Galadriel's boat and left her to die. Anyway, back to the scene in question. What I think the writers want to do is have Elendil, who up until this point was the one guy who seemed to believe in Galadriel, due of course to the sea always being right, and as a result of losing his son and a few Numenorians, he now wishes that he had never crossed paths with her. Setting aside for a moment the whole sea is always right thing, this still doesn't function at all because what these characters know is entirely unclear, as is what we know as the audience. Elendil maybe knows that Isildur is dead, or maybe knows that he is alive somewhere, or maybe that he is wounded or lost or something. We have no idea at this point. As I said previously, it actually can't be any of these things, because if Afrok had said anything other than Isildur is totally fine and he is at the encampment, which Elendil at this point would know to be false, then Elendil would at this very moment be scouring the ruins of Tirharad to find his son. That he doesn't do this tells us that he does not care if his son is alive or even where his body is. Pretty pathetic, huh? To elaborate on this a bit and absolutely cut off any potential olive branches, being unclear about whether or not a character is alive is not inherently a problem. There are many ways that this can be done effectively. For an example, let's look at Aragorn in the Two Towers. After the Warg fight, Aragorn is thrown off a cliff and into a river. Legolas, Gimli, and Theoden conclude after interrogating an orc that Aragorn is dead. This might be a stretch, but I think it's fair to say that everyone in the audience knew that Aragorn was not actually dead. So, why take up precious screen time to try and trick the audience into thinking that one of the main characters has died rather unceremoniously? Well, firstly, there is a narrative purpose for this because as a result of being separated, Aragorn witnesses the scale of Isengard's army and is able to report this to Theoden. More importantly, however, the characters all react to this. As a direct result of Aragorn falling into the river, we get character conflict between Theoden and the other characters. We learn about them through their actions, and this event is used to explore the characters in the movie. In Rings of Power, the most charitable interpretation is that Afrok told Elendil off-screen that Isildur is dead. Elendil's reaction to this is also off-screen. Afrok and Elendil could both be described as vaguely sad, which is not exactly a believable nor appropriate reaction to your friend or son dying. Consequently, we do not learn anything about Elendil or Afrok's relationship with Isildur from this sequence of events beyond they are mildly unhappy that he is dead, which is about as simplistic a reaction as possible and is not unlike something I would expect in a cartoon for babies. Anyway, we then see that Galadriel and Theo have also arrived at the Numenorean encampment. Theo rushes off to try and find his mother. After walking past many wounded and dying, he is able to locate Bronwyn, who seems to be both entirely uninjured by the volcanic eruption and also seemingly has full use of her left arm after the rather rudimentary patch job they did to her, uh, yesterday. Additionally, the question as to why she is here and not looking for Theo in the ruins of Tiharad is not accounted for. Also, if you recall, in episode 6, Elendil told Muriel that it would be a day's ride from the shore across the mountains and into the Southlands. I will be charitable and assume that by the Southlands he is specifically referring to Tiharad because we already know that they somehow knew that they needed to go there. This means that it takes a day to ride from the Numenorean encampment to Tiharad. Google tells me that horses can typically ride between 25 and 30 miles a day. As we are told that this is over mountains, I will again be charitable and assume that Tiharad is maybe 20 miles from the coast. Firstly, no fucking way. Secondly, People suffering the kinds of injuries that we see in this tent, including Bronwyn, who was seriously wounded hours earlier, are not walking 20 miles through mountains. Given the terrain, this is easily going to take 10 hours of non-stop walking. We have no reference for how long it actually did take them, potentially these scenes at the encampment are now taking place a full week after the eruption, but even if you have all the time in the world, I simply do not believe that this is possible. Anyway, Arendir has also made it out entirely unscathed. This means that, as suspected, not one single main character was killed in the eruption when the presumption has to be that every single one of them should be dead, unless we are given very specific reasons as to why this is not the case. 
As a result of the eruption, Elendil, Galadriel, Miriel, Arendir, Theo, Bronwyn, Afrok, Adar, Halbrand, and Isildur have all survived. Ontimo has died, and Miriel appears to be blind, although that was not as a direct result of the eruption. These are some seriously broken stakes. Cause and effect need not apply here. This is a fantasy show, don't you know? Anyway, back to the scene. Theo and Arendir embrace, which is a culmination of their relationship going from what's one of them doing here to Theo embracing him for presumably saving his mother's life. Galadriel then enters and asks to see Muriel. We see that Muriel is sat outside wearing a blindfold. This... how do I put this? If you want to conceal the fact that you can't see, wearing a blindfold is probably the worst thing that you can do. Anyway, Elendil informs her that they are ready to depart within the hour, but will leave behind one garrison to escort the surviving Southlanders to a safe settlement and search for any missing Numenorians. A few questions, if you don't mind. Shouldn't this take a little bit longer and be a bit more logistically complex than, all right, let's go. They have just arrived, and now they're immediately leaving. They are not allowing any time to allow anyone else to get here. The Numenorians have literally been in the Southlands for 24 hours at most. And now, yep, let's go, our work here is done. The larger problem, however, and oh boy, I was waiting for them to confirm this, is that Elendil has just revealed that a safe settlement does, in fact, exist. This means that the Southlanders had zero reason to stay in either Tirharad or Osterith. Presumably they just kind of didn't mention this, which means that we have no reference and the best we can do is say that it doesn't seem very believable, but now we have been explicitly told that everything that happened in Episode 6 was entirely unnecessary. They could, in fact, have just left. Also, not to step on your toes here, Elendil, but isn't Halbrand the king of the Southlands? Isn't this his call? Anyway, Galadriel and... why the fuck is Bronwyn here? Oh, because she's a main character. All right, all right, retarded alter ego, now get back in your hole. Upon seeing Galadriel, Elendil reacts rather negatively, which is at least in line with him apparently blaming Galadriel for all of this, even though that isn't in line with anything else. Galadriel then kneels down out of respect upon realizing that Muriel has been blinded. She apologizes to both Muriel and Elendil for bringing them to the Southlands. Muriel then says, Do not spend your pity on me, Elf. Save it. For our enemies. For they do not know what they have begun. For I, Miriel, daughter of Ar Inziladun, vow this. Numenor will return. Suggesting that there will be a full-on battle between the Elves and Numenorians against the Orcs. I am unsure why Muriel wants to do this. I am unsure why Galadriel is also on board, given that she blames herself for everything that has happened. And I am also unsure why the suggestion that Numenor will return to the Southlands is enough to make Elendil start to cry. I don't know why this wasn't his reaction to hearing that his son has died, or actually, this tells us that this likely was his reaction, meaning I have no idea why we didn't see it. Elendil is evidently not a stone-hearted soldier who will put on a brave face when needed, and in the wrong circumstances he will succumb to emotion even when performing his military role. This means that he absolutely would have broken down into tears when Afrok told him that Isildur is dead, unless we are expected to believe that he loves his country more than his son. But I guess having a cheap cliffhanger is more important than having realistic on-screen dramatic weight. Also, to make sure I'm being clear, I'm not saying that Elendil should not be crying. I just find it extremely odd that we are being shown Elendil crying upon being told that Numenor is going to return, but we are not shown him crying upon learning that his son is dead. Okay, so Elendil reacts emotionally both on and off screen. Muriel does not give up easily. Galadriel gets over her guilt in about five seconds. And Bronwyn regenerates health faster than Master Chief. And we then return to the Harfoots, who have just had their entire mobile village of caravans get burned to a crisp entirely because Nori didn't follow the fucking rules. Let's see what happens next. Okay, so it appears that they are picking up the pieces and salvaging what they can. I assume, then, that the Androgenites just kind of left. Before Nori's father told them to back off, they were about to presumably abduct Nori, or maybe just steal a nut that she wears on her head for some fucking reason, because I assume they saw through her misdirection. They have to be aware that she knows where not Gandalf is, or at the very least that she knows something. But I guess instead of furthering their apparent goal of locating him, which need I remind you is their one and only character trait, they decide to set everything on fire. 
Anyway, Nori's father asks her to help them pick up the charred remains of their home. On your feet now, girl. Stand up. Help me gather what we can. Nori, now. Don't let this spin to your spirit. It'll be all right. So why exactly is everything going to be all right? Nori's father says explicitly that he isn't just telling Nori what she wants to hear, so I guess we have to assume that he genuinely believes that they aren't all going to die horribly as a result of having no homes. They are three feet tall, they have no martial skills, and they are now stranded with no shelter. But yeah, everything will be all right. She's too old for that now. I wasn't lying. It will be all right. Pity's sake, Brandyfoot. Give us a moment to weep. Is no one going to acknowledge that this is entirely Nori's fault? Also, I find it very amusing that the show wants us to feel bad for the Harfoots, but because much of their screen time has been dedicated to showing us in detail why they are all terrible people who don't care about each other, I very much find myself unable to empathize with them in the slightest. Anyway, Nori's father then gives them all a motivational speech, which confirms that, yeah, none of them are aware that Nori is the reason this happened. You might think I'm overstating this, but let me explain. If I see an alien standing outside my house, and I run outside and shout at the alien without any understanding of what it is or what it can do, and as a result, the alien vaporizes my family. This would be entirely as a result of my own stupidity. In his uplifting speech, Nori's father says, We stay true to each other. Which is, hilariously, the literal opposite of what you do, but okay. This means that the Harfords, including the ones that get left behind, genuinely believe that they all look out for and take care of each other. These two things are very much mutually exclusive and make the Harford society fundamentally unbelievable. It does not function as depicted. Inspired by her father's motivational words, Nori decides to grab a couple of apples and go and find not Gandalf. Nori, where are you going? To help my friend. Warn him what's coming. He deserves at least that. <sighs> I actually can't believe this. As a direct result of Nori breaking their community rules, retarded though they may be, her entire family got abandoned and yet miraculously didn't die. She got attacked by wolves and yet miraculously didn't die. Not Gandalf dropped a tree on her and yet miraculously she didn't die. Feminem burned down all their caravans and miraculously no one died. After all this, she has decided to go wandering off on her own to warn Not Gandalf that the Androgynites be coming. This can partially be explained by Nori being brave. For it to be entirely explained, however, she must also be retarded. This requires that Nori firstly knows where he is, and secondly believes that she can reach him before the Androgynites, even though they have at the very least a few hours head start, given that it is now daytime, and given that they are regular people-sized people, whereas the Harfords are like three foot nothing. There is no way you should be able to catch up with not Gandalf, and everyone here should know this. Going off trail? Now? Alone? She won't be alone. We've left enough folk behind, we're not leaving him. Okay, fine, you're, you're, doing, you're doing something that's vaguely Lord of the Ringsy. Mr. Frodo's not going anywhere without me. But, as with everything in Rings of Power, it is only superficially Lord of the Ringsy. It is borrowing elements that people like from the movies and shoehorning them into its own story. The problem is that if Frodo's reason for going to Mordor was because he is retarded, and Sam's reason for joining him is that he is also retarded, then the scene becomes retarded. That is how writing works. You can't just copy dialogue or themes and insert them into scenes that don't make sense and expect me not to notice. I'm onto you, Rings of Power. After seven episodes, I am sure as shit onto you. You girls aren't going anywhere. Not without me. Yeah, this seems like the responsible thing to do. And then Malva convinces Sadok to join them as well. You go into those woods, you might never come out alive. They might, if a trail finder were to go with them. Brandyfoot girl was right to help him. Was right all along. What's the good of living, Sadok? If we aren't living good. You know, Malva, just once, it would be grand if you weren't right all the time. Yeah. Because Malva, Malva is just so right all the time. Remember when she said they should break camp because of the spooky wolves that didn't attack them until they broke camp? Remember when she refused to help with setting up the festival because she was too busy being a fat, which resulted in Nori's dad breaking his ankle? Remember when she said Nori's father won't be able to walk because of his leg? She was actually correct here, but evidently did not comprehend that this was at least partially her fault. Remember when she said that Nori's family should be decaravaned because she broke the rules, which had they done so would have resulted in Malva being eaten by wolves? Remember when she said that they should steal their wheels and leave them to fucking die? Remember when she said Nori should ask not Gandalf to fix the tree? We all know how that went. Point being, there is nothing Malva has said in this entire season which has ended up being the right thing to do, morally or otherwise. She is quite literally wrong every time she opens her mouth, which I had assumed was the entire point of the character. 
She embodies the worst aspects of the Harfoots. She is super eager to leave people behind. She seems to get hard by punishing children, and she reacts like an oblivious twat when Poppy tells her to stop being an asshole. But yeah, Malva's right all the time. This goddamn scene. So everyone is just banding together to go on a quest to tell not Gandalf that some weirdos are maybe looking for him, because they don't actually know this. And no one acknowledges that Nori has done anything wrong. This would be like everyone at the Council of Elrond deciding to go and help Frodo minutes after Frodo blew up all their houses. I can't, guys. I can't. The Harfoot's plot was just filler to me until now, but Episode 7 has nearly managed to bring it down to the same level of awfulness that the other plot lines have somehow managed to achieve. The only thing that this scene was missing was Nori's father forgetting that he has a broken ankle and deciding to go with them. Okay, so Nori is dedicated to helping people even if it risks people's lives and Sadok does not understand how cause and effect works. And we then cut back to the Numenorians. We see that Muriel and the Numenorians have departed entirely within one single boat, which suggests that they lost so many people that they were unable to fill more than one boat. Somewhere in the region of 300 to 400 Numenorians have died, which was not alluded to whatsoever. And the Southlanders are also apparently ready to travel as well. This, given the lack of technology available, is astounding. Bronwyn tells us exactly where they could have gone back in episode two. Where will you go? An old Numenorian colony by the mouth of the Anduin. Pelage, they called it. They say there's fresh land, fresh water. And Galadriel then says that she will report to Gilgalad, which is a conversation I am genuinely looking forward to. As far as Gilgalad is aware, Galadriel went to Valinor in episode one. I am very much anticipating seeing his reaction to the amount of contrived bullshit that Galadriel has been through. Then Galadriel is informed that Halbrand, the king of the Southlands, is badly injured. He has a large gash in his chest and is clearly suffering from a fever. Galadriel determines that she needs elvish medicine to heal him. I'm not exactly sure where Galadriel is going to take him because they're about as far from any elven lands as possible. And Halbrand says that although he is injured, he has no intention of abandoning the Southlands after what happened in episode six and says that he knows Galadriel will not either. This tells us that Halbrand is very dedicated to his newfound role as king and fully intends to retake the Southlands alongside the elves and Numenorians. Okay, so the fact that Halbrand is walking around here suggests that his wound is not actually that bad, which conflicts with Galadriel's diagnosis. The Southlanders cheer for Halbrand and presumably know that he is coming back even though he literally just met them. And I also find it rather amusing that if not for Galadriel being here right now, Halbrand could very well have died. If Galadriel was killed or injured, or if it took her an extra couple of days to get to the encampment, I have to assume that Halbrand would have just died from sepsis. Anyway, the horses depart at speed, which also suggests that Halbrand is actually doing okay. We don't know exactly where they're going until episode 8, so I will criticize that then. Or, who knows, maybe I'll praise it, but I doubt it. And we then cut back to Khazad Doom, where Deesa is consoling Durin. Durin believes that all of this is entirely his fault, but Deesa says it is the king who is at fault. It's your father's. He's grown too old, too suspicious, his mind too feeble, his eyes too dim to see that no matter how many crests he hurls to the floor, one day this will be your kingdom. And we then learn that Durin has a brother, which is good to know, seven episodes in. Anyway, Deesa then says that they will rule the mountain together, reaffirming her dedication to her husband and her eagerness and ambition as a future leader. And together we will rule this mountain and all others before our time is done. That Mithril belongs to us. To you and me. I can see why she is saying this, but no. Currently it belongs to the king. Essentially, Deesa is suggesting that the king's time is near and that soon they will take the throne, which given the sudden existence of a brother along with multiple other dwarf lords may not actually be a sure thing. This, I think, has some potential, although I wish we had had more of an explanation of Deesa's character before now, because this still feels like they are setting up fundamentals after seven full episodes. I am definitely expecting far, far too much at this point, but I'm having visions of Deesa becoming almost a Cersei-type character, killing Durin's father and manipulating her husband into the position of king against his wishes once he learns of how power-obsessed his wife has become. There is no fucking way that Rings of Power will do this, and if they try, they will absolutely fuck it up. 
but I can dream. Rings of power can't stop me. Anyway, we then see the king ordering the mithril mine be sealed up, and as the camera follows the corrupted leaf into the depths, we see that there is a balrog hiding down there. I despise this. The balrog was, I guess, asleep and was apparently woken up by the leaf falling next to him and then decided to do a roar at the camera. This is fucking pathetic. They are using the balrog as a cheap cliffhanger. It's just hiding down there for some reason. And they are leveraging the fact that the balrog is an absolutely iconic aspect of Middle Earth, and specifically the design from the Peter Jackson movies, in order to make the crayon eaters still watching at this point go, Oh, it's, is that oh, I like the it's, Oh my oh, wow. god, it's wait, the guys, Balrog. Just, I yeah, remember yeah, the Balrog. It's, 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 has um, fire. Fuck this scene, and fuck this show. I know, I'm reacting emotionally, but every now and then, I'm allowed to do that. There have been a couple of times where this has happened, and using the fucking Balrog as a cheap cliffhanger to try and trick the brainlets into forgetting that this entire goddamn show doesn't make sense is pathetic. But it doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense. It's the Balrog. Yeah. Y you may in fact be right, retarded alter ego. And that makes me sad. Okay, so Deesa is eager to become a leader, and the writers are manipulative swines. And because one cliffhanger is not enough, and because a huge amount of Rings of Power is driven by mystery box writing, we return to Adar to see what happened after the end of episode 6. After he miraculously escaped the barn and survived the explosion, of course. He tells the orcs that the Southlands is now their home. Waldreg is also still alive and gets the orcs to start chanting for Adar. Adar then tells them that the Southlands does not exist anymore, and that it is going to be called Mordor because Mordor is where the orcs live and it's the vo there's a volcano and it was good and it was in the movie and there's fire. And guys, it's Lord of the Rings. You like Lord of the Rings? Gosh, it's, it's, we're back in Middle Earth because I like seeing it's the thing that I know and it makes me feel all bubbly. And remember, there is about, we're going to see the Balrog and we will see Mordor. Okay, so now it's time to analyze each main plot line in the episode and determine what the writers wanted to achieve and how they went about doing so. In this episode, I will combine the Southlands and Numenor plots into one because they are taking place in the same location, and then we also have the Khazad Doom plot and the Harfoot's plots. Let's begin by looking at the Harfoot plot. This one is pretty simple. The writers needed Nori's family to arrive at the Grove, for not Gandalf to end up banished, and for a collection of plucky young heroes to set off and go and rescue him. Nori's family arriving at the Grove isn't really a problem with this episode. Their survival and lack of reaction to it is something I've already criticized. So let's begin with the events that cause not Gandalf to end up banished. The writers decided to tie this in with the volcanic eruption in episode 6 by having large pieces of volcanic debris not only be able to travel the presumed hundreds of miles to get here, but also having the Harfoots being so monumentally unlucky as to have these rocks land exactly where they need to in order to cause this character conflict. If these rocks can travel anywhere up to 100 miles of the volcano, then this means that there is a 100 mile diameter surrounding the volcano in which they could have fallen. But they landed here because this is where one of our plot lines is taking place, of course. As a result of the rocks, a whole bunch of trees are dead, meaning there is not enough food for the Harfoots. This is something that I think is reasonable to infer, but is not explicitly stated in the show. This causes Sadok to ask not Gandalf to use some magic to try and fix the trees, which I don't have a problem with, but I do think that they needed to do a lot more setup so that we can clearly understand why he is doing this. Going purely from what we see in the show, there are maybe 10 trees that have been in some way damaged by the volcanic rocks. There are plenty of other trees that they can go to, and this is not something that is ever accounted for. If the entire grove had been annihilated by volcanic debris, then I think it would make complete sense for Sadok to ask the dangerous magical entity for help, because it would under those circumstances be a last resort. What we get instead, however, is that Sadok just kind of thinks it might be a cool idea for not Gandalf to try and fix this particular tree. Luckily, not Gandalf is both willing and able to do this. Unluckily, Nori and her sister are retarded, and their parents are unobservant to the point of being wildly irresponsible. This is like Harambe all over again. God damn it, Harambe was six years ago. I feel old. Additionally, it is also unlucky that the branch just so happened to fall in such a way as to not only land on Nori and her sister, but also to not actually hurt or kill them. This entire scene requires that the best and worst outcomes possible are achieved through characters being idiots. Anyway, the perception of the Harfoots is that not Gandalf is extremely dangerous and nearly killed two of their own because he is not in control of his power. What actually happened though is that not Gandalf was doing precisely what he was asked to do, and Nori's sister decided to be like, it's a and got squashed by a branch because she is an idiot. 
Anyway, the Harfoots, including Nori and her family, whom Not Gandalf had previously helped multiple times, decide to ask him to leave, which he does. Not Gandalf is not going to be staying with Nori forever. If anything, the entire point of the Harfoots plot is to introduce Not Gandalf. But my god, the way that the writers decided to have him realize he doesn't belong with them is just incompetently written nonsense. Afterwards, Nori realizes that Not Gandalf's magic did in fact work, which leads to her wanting to protect him from the Androgenites, which then causes their village to be burned down. None of this functions. Firstly, I will look specifically at Nori's character arc so far. She starts off as someone who goes off trail because she isn't like the other girls. Her mum and her community largely disapprove of this. She then finds not Gandalf, and as a result of this, or so we are told, her father breaks his ankle. As a result, Nori realizes that maybe going off trail is a bad thing. Then not Gandalf shows her some stars, and she decides that actually going off trail is okay because it means she can help him. As a result of helping him, he is revealed to the other Harfoots, and Nori and her family are abandoned. As a result of this, her mother tells her to stop going off trail. Then not Gandalf helps them migrate, meaning that actually going off trail might have been a good thing. Then Nori almost loses her arm and gets crushed by a tree due to her own stupidity, and realizes that she never should have gone off trail in the first place. Then, upon realizing that not Gandalf wasn't so bad after all, she directly causes their entire village to be burned down. What is her response to this? Well, you might expect Nori to freak out and be firmly sat in the stay on the motherfucking trail camp, now that the consequences for her not doing so have become severe. But no. Not only does Nori decide to go and help not Gandalf, but Poppy, her mother, and Sadok all decide to go off trail together. Nori should not be doing this. Nori should not think that this is a good idea. She has just directly seen the consequences of breaking the rules. That Sadok and her mother also decide to join her when both characters had previously been extremely rules-oriented traditionalists is even more absurd and requires that the entire Harfoot society is incapable of comprehending basic cause and effect. Anyway, now for the other aspect of this scene. The Androgenites, of course, pop up out of nowhere. They have essentially had no setup, and they are just kind of here now to pose a threat and propel the plot. Nori also knows for certain that they are looking for not Gandalf when she couldn't possibly know this. All she knows is that they looked at a tree. And finally, the Androgenite's decision to burn down the Harfoot's village is hilarious because it amounts to nothing more than I am evil. This would be laughable on its own, but the kicker is that they just kind of leave after doing this. From their perspective, they have found a tree that I guess has hints of magical properties, and from this they are able to work out correctly, given Nori's reaction, the direction that not Gandalf headed in. I don't have a problem with this because the specifics of how magic works and what these people even are is not explained. So they have a heading and they begin walking in that direction. Then some kid pops up out of a bush and is like, hey guys, he went that way. You should totally go that way too. So in response to this, they try to grab and presumably abduct her because she obviously knows something, and then this guy hobbles in front of them waving a torch in their face. So naturally, they obliterate the nearby caravans with sorcery and leave. None of this follows, but it is of course necessary to facilitate the plot requirements of the various characters. Now we're going to look at the Elrond plot in episode 7. When we last saw Elrond, he had convinced Durin to help him acquire Mithril to save the elves. I have many problems with this, but for the sake of this video, uh, fine, I'll just accept that this is their starting point. The writers needed to have the king refuse to help, but for Elrond to ultimately leave khazad Doom with a piece of Mithril. Episode 7 does the most damage out of any of the prior episodes when it comes to this plotline, and that is saying a lot. So, as is typical of this show, the stakes are unclear. If Elrond can't get Mithril, the elves must leave Middle-earth. How this equates in any way to dying is a mystery. Don't get me wrong, abandoning a good part of your empire would suck, but it's not quite as bad as the eradication of the elven species. Also, why Gilgalad knows about the Mithril and its properties is entirely unclear. Now that I have outlined these initial problems with the setup, we can move on to what actually happens in the episode. Elrond fails to convince the king to help. Why the king distrusts elves and appears to be willing to let them die is entirely a mystery. My presumption is that the writers decided that elves and dwarves don't like each other in Lord of the Rings, so they just copied and pasted, forgetting that the events of this show are supposed to be exploring the history that occurred before the Lord of the Rings. Anyway, given how desperately the elves need Mithril, which is clearly communicated to the king, the idea of a war between their two species is never accounted for. Gilgalad is in a position where he needs Mithril. There is no plan B. There are no circumstances under which he will accept no for an answer. Elrond makes this clear when negotiating with the king. 
Nonetheless, the dwarf's answer is still no, even though if there were any shred of realism in Amazon's Middle Earth, this would at the very least cause the question of war to be raised, even if only in private. In the scene afterwards, where the king explains to Durin why he is not going to help the elves, Durin could well have said something along the lines of, You don't understand, the elves need this mineral. They are literally all going to die if we don't help them. There is no way they are going to take this lying down. Anyway, the answer is no, because the script required that the answer be no, and this causes Elrond to give up, even though Elrond has been established to be a person who does not give up easily. If I had a nickel for every contradiction in this show, I would have found a strangely effective way of making a living. Anyway, because we can't have Elrond give up just yet, because he has to leave khazad -dûm with some mithril for reasons that will become clear in episode 8, Durin, through some contrived nonsense, makes Elrond stay so that they can explore the mine and try and convince the king to help once again. As a result of this, Elrond is finally banished from khazad -dûm, taking with him a piece of mithril, presumably the one that Durin had given him previously. Why Elrond was not searched and how he was able to conceal this is simply incredible. From the king's perspective, Elrond is a dishonorable lie. Actually, I don't even need to add the caveat that this be from the king's perspective. Elrond is a dishonorable liar, one that desperately wants to acquire Mithril for reasons that he has explained. To not search him is to allow him to steal something that has incomprehensible value. So not only is it incredibly lucky that the king does not imprison Elrond, or worse, but he also does not search him, thus leading to something that I have been told happens in episode 8, which I will save for that video. This plotline has turned King Durin III into a moron on the same level as basically every other character in the show. Deesa is now my only hope. Deesa is, I think, the one character with any amount of screen time that has not done anything retarded. Yet. If she makes it through episode 8 unscathed, or if she is in fact not in episode 8, then Deesa is hands down the best character in the show. And now we round off the trio of plot lines in episode 7 with the Southlands plot. This episode needed to show us the aftermath of the volcanic eruption in episode 6, and that's kind of it. Everything else that this episode explores is character, which is partly why it is so abysmal, because this show barely has characters. So first I'll cover the mechanics because that won't take any time. Before Tirharad got hit by the volcanic ash cloud, everyone was pretty well clumped together and within, say, 100 meters of each other. As a result of the ensuing chaos of the village being destroyed, the characters were spread out away from each other. I can totally buy this happening, it is not only believable but I would say necessary in the aftermath of a natural disaster. However, the writers have apparently decided to use this splitting up of characters in order to allow for specific character development. Neither their method nor the development itself is functional. So from the beginning, Galadriel and Theo end up right next to each other. Isildur, Afrok, and Muriel also end up close to each other. Halbrand, Arendir, and Bronwyn are all presumably far enough away from these other groups. Elendil is somehow nowhere near any of the above. Galadriel is paired with Theo so that we can speed run the thematic aspect of Galadriel seeing herself in Theo, no not in that way you pervert, and allow Theo to grapple with the idea of the consequences of being consumed by vengeance. Afrok, Muriel, and Isildur are all together so that Muriel can get injured whilst rescuing people, and so that Isildur can get killed in inverted commas. Elendil is nowhere near them so that he is unable to interfere with the above. And Halbrand, Arendir, and Bronwyn are not part of any of these groups because they don't have any required character development in this episode. So I'll begin with the issues with the Theo and Galadriel plot. Galadriel wakes up after having survived taking a volcano to the face and immediately encounters Theo. Instead of helping anyone else, she just kind of wanders off into the woods with him. I think the show wants us to believe she is utterly shell-shocked by what has just happened to her, hence her reaction or lack of reaction at the end of episode 6, but this is not corroborated by anything else in this episode. She's just like, oh there's some kid, let's go. And she also claims to know that Theo is not responsible for what happened, which she can't know because she doesn't know anything about Theo. She doesn't know what happened in the tavern when he gave Adar the evil sword. Theo had no opportunity to tell her, meaning that the writers are trying to establish a thematic through line by giving characters information that they do not have. Until I see episode 8, I can't comment yet on where Galadriel will be at the end of the season, but by the ending of episode 7, she seems to be leaning in the direction of regretting her past actions. I definitely have comments on this, but I will hold off until the end of the season. Anyway, the other primary character development here is Elendil, and to say it is a hot fucking mess would be an understatement. I have no idea why he reacts in the way that he does. 
I have no idea why the writers decided that Elendil would not at least try to find his son's body. I have no idea why Elendil was not in very close proximity to the rest of them at the start of the episode. The only part of Elendil's arc that I do understand to some degree is his anger with Galadriel. It might make sense for the Numenorians to blame her specifically for roping them into heading to the Southlands, but with the information Elendil has, I do not believe that he would blame her. Elendil knows Galadriel better than anyone else who sailed from Numenor. From what we have seen, Elendil is also the oldest person there, with the exception of Galadriel and Arendir, and is presumably far more experienced, if not in war, than at least in dealing with intense emotional situations. Yes, he is clearly under an amount of emotional stress due to his son supposedly dying, but this also doesn't function as intended. You can't tell me that Elendil cares deeply for his son, but also that he doesn't care to check if he is actually dead. You can't tell me that Elendil hates that Galadriel has indirectly caused the deaths of hundreds of his people, but also is in the unique position of knowing and understanding Galadriel's motives more than anyone else. But tell us these things this show does, and apparently without the writers even being aware. So, how do we sum up this episode? Well, it is definitely in the running for the worst of the lot. It relies entirely on nonsense character interactions. It sets up pivotal drama for either episode 8 or season 2 by further dismantling reality and having characters do things that they have no reason to do. It repurposes elements of The Lord of the Rings to use as cheap cliffhangers so that people continue their subscription to Amazon Prime. There are many critical elements that are simply not explained, which we can add to the list. Yes, there is a list. Yes, I will present it in my end of series autopsy. Can episode 8 do anything to fix episodes 1 to 7? I mean, I suppose it could have Galadriel wake up after having a nightmare and reveal that the entire season was all a horrible dream. Short of that, the damage is very much done. Each episode requires that you accept the insane nonsense that came before. Theoretically, this could result in standalone episodes that are mostly competent, but so far very little about Rings of Power has been anywhere near competent. I am not looking forward to watching episode 8, but I am very much looking forward to finishing this series because it has been causing me unfathomable degrees of mental anguish, and it seems to be providing a few of you guys on YouTube some kind of perverse catharsis. When I finish episode 8, I am probably going to watch my extended Lord of the Rings Blu-rays to wash the taste of incredible mediocrity out of my brain. Anyway. This video is already way longer than this episode deserves, so I will leave it here. Thank you guys so much for watching once again. Um, please, if you have not already, consider liking, sharing, or subscribing, because I've only got one episode to go, and then I've got the final autopsy that I'm going to do at the end. You have probably noticed that there is an ever-growing gap in between each of these videos, and that is primarily because the longer this series goes on, the longer it takes to properly analyze each episode. Even if the videos don't end up being longer than the ones before them, which in basically every case they do, but even if not, it still takes me substantially longer to gather all the references and actually make sure that what I'm saying is correct. I still think it's insane that at the point when I uploaded my first Rings of Power video, I had like 58 subscribers. And as of writing this, I have just broken 1,800. So thank you again to every single one of you. And again, if you're still watching, I am super happy that you are enjoying my content. It takes a long time for me to do, and I'm glad that people are enjoying it. So thank you again, and I will see you when I do my coverage of episode 8.